So welcome to everyone. Um, really exciting panel. Um, we're going to spend the next hour and a half together um, really talking through how we prevent gender-based violence, um, looking at some of the evidence um, and looking at some of the crises we've been facing. COVID, of course, um, and we're going to hear about crises as they've manifested elsewhere, particularly in Lebanon. Um, this is, of course, an incredibly important time to be talking about gender-based violence. I think COVID has really thrown into stark relief some of the fault lines that drive gender-based violence, that exacerbate violence for survivors of violence. Um, and we're going to hear about that. And then we're going to also shift to really think about um, what is effective in preventing and addressing gender-based violence. Um, before I go any further, though, let me introduce myself um, and say a few words about the panelists we're lucky to have with us today. Um, I am Dean Peacock. I am currently the director of a new initiative at the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom to confront militarized masculinities and to mobilize men for feminist peace working in um, four focus countries, Afghanistan, Cameroon, Colombia, and the DRC. Um, and I've been working to address gender-based violence really for the last 30 years with a strong focus on engaging men and boys. Um, and so I'll be curious as we um, hear the presentations today um, to hear how the issue of men and masculinities is framed in the presentation, um, recognizing, of course, that there are many essential strategies to address GBV and engaging men and boys, just one of them. Um, and um, so, yeah, I um, have been doing this work for a long time. I'm one of the co-founders of the Men Engage Alliance and worked for a long time in South Africa, which is where I'm from, and where I directed an organization, Sonke Gender Justice, that works across the continent, really in the intersections of gender inequalities, HIV, and care. Um, and so delighted to have with me today um, four fantastic panelists, and I'll introduce them very briefly now in the order that they will present. Um, first um, up today will be Isabella Salgado, who's a policy associate at the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab at MIT, where she supports the crime, violence, and conflict sector. Um, and Isabella is going to start us off with an overview of COVID and kind of a brief snapshot of um, gender-based violence generally and some of what we know is effective at addressing it. Um, we'll then turn to Lauren Van Meter from the National Democratic Institute. Um, Lauren is a peace and security expert. She's worked on major conflict resolution and prevention initiatives at the Pentagon, the State Department, the US Institute of Peace, and at the Atlantic Council. She joined NDI recently in 2018 to lead the Institute's new peace, security, and democratic resilience initiative. Um, and she's going to talk about that work. Uh, welcome, Lauren. Um, we will then turn to uh, Dr. Vandana Sharma, who's a global health researcher at the Harvard uh, Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Humanitarian in Initiative. Um, Vandana brings expertise in impact evaluations, and we're going to hear today especially about important work she and her colleagues have been doing in Ethiopia. Um, and then the session will be closed off by Vicky al Zwain from Lebanon. Um, she is a political activist and women's rights fighter. Uh, she's currently an elected municipal councillor in Lebanon, um, serving her second term as head of the local development committee, focusing on community outreach. And Vicky's going to give us an overview of the situation and the multiple crises, really, um, that people in Lebanon have been facing, particularly women, and um, I think inspire us with some stories about women's rights activism in Lebanon. Um, so we'll then um, open it up for questions. We should have about 30 minutes um, if participants can stick to time. Um, and um, we'll open it up to the floor. I see we now have close to 50 participants. Um, and so we look forward to your thoughts and reflections um, as we proceed. Um, so I think with that, um, I will turn it over to Isabella to walk us through her presentation. Welcome, Isabella. The floor is yours. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dean, for this great introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. 
Um, so as Dean mentioned, I'll be talking a little bit about how COVID has impacted women's experience of violence. Um, so before I begin talking about the data and the facts, I wanted to start with a quick definition of what gender-based violence is. Definitely a term that everyone here must be familiar with. Um, so GBV uh, is used to uh, refer to the violence that is director and an individual because of their gender. Um, and it can um, take many forms. GBV can be uh, physical violence, sexual, verbal, emotional. Um, and it can also happen both um, in the private sphere as in the public space. Also, the consequences of GBV we might be familiar with. They are multidimensional from health consequences, such as HIV transmission, injuries and depression, but also economic costs, such as reduction in labor productivity, which might lead to reductions in income, and also social stigma. So I like to begin with this quick overview just to uh, show everyone that GBV is a very complex problem. So today we'll be talking about violence against women and in particular intimate partner violence, but gender-based violence is also experienced by men, by boys, and by minority groups from different gender and sexual orientation groups. So um, it is a very complex issue and I will just try to focus a little bit on one aspect of it, which is violence against women. Um, so, uh, most of you might be familiar with uh, the international community using the term shadow pandemic to refer to the rises in cases of uh, gender-based violence and violence against women uh, with the strike of COVID-19. Uh, but I just wanted to note that IPV and GBV have been an ongoing issue, uh, an ongoing public health and human rights issue for many years now. Uh, so we know that organizations such as the UN and the World Bank, even before COVID-19, had been referring to gender-based violence as a global pandemic. Um, so some stats that we might be familiar with are that uh, one in three women worldwide have experienced physical or sexual violence at some point in their life times. We also know that most victims or survivors, excuse me, of intimate partner violence um, are women. And we also know that a lot of the cases that actually happen go unreported. Uh, so uh, estimates show that less than 40% of women who experience violence seek help after that, that happens. And from those women, less than 10% actually uh, go for the police to report those cases. So this only shows that how much of a issue it is and how much goes on without us knowing. Uh, but what we saw with the strike of COVID-19 was a rise in the reported cases around the world. Um, so what people have been uh, referring to the shadow pandemic. So we know that uh, COVID-19 has imposed an array of unprecedented challenges over the field of uh, people working with intimate partner violence. So with the rises in unemployment, we know that a lot of families have been going through reductions in income, which might be leading to some uh, stress related to lack of resources. And at the same time, everyone is at home and the household tasks and the childbearing tasks have been uh, falling disproportionately over women, which might also increase stress in households. Um, and with lockdowns, everyone is trapped inside and what we see is an increase of um, familial stress which might lead to uh, higher risks of conflict and as we have been seeing higher crazy, uh, reported cases of domestic abuse and domestic violence. And on top of that we know that the services uh, that women usually seek to uh, after experience violence such as familial bonds and um, health services or social services provided by the government are not being um, functioning as well as they did before because of the pandemic. Um, so this is the state of uh, what we know about gender-based violence right now. And what this comes out to us is that there is a lot of need for evidence-based policy solutions. So this is a moment that we should be looking at um, evidence from, from evaluations all around the world, from impact evaluations, to identify the best programs and the most successful programs that can help us tackle this issue during COVID-19 and, of course, after COVID-19. 
So now I'll just share a little bit of this evidence that we know from JPAL. So to give a little bit, just a quick intro to JPAL, we are a network of affiliated researchers that are running randomized evaluations or RCTs, maybe you're familiar with it, all around the world. And we have our regional offices, so people like me who work with our researchers to draw insights from their research and help policymakers and decision makers implementing and focusing policies that are have proven to be affected through uh, effective through randomized evaluations. So that's, of course, the case of the work we're doing on gender-based violence. Um, so sharing just a very quick snapshot of what we know from this growing body of research that has been evaluating policies looking at gender-based violence. Um, so we know that there's a lot of work on providing economic resources to women as a way to improve their financial um, empowerment and also reduce familial stress related to lack of resources and improve women's empowerment in the household. Uh, though that's believed to be a potential way to um, reduce those stresses and improve empowerment to reduce women experiences of violence. So we have a lot of research that has looked at the impact of these programs, such as looking at cash transfers, microcredit pro programs, saving groups. And from crash cash transfers, there is a growing body of evidence showing that it might be an effective way to actually um, reduce IPV by um, tackling those factors that I mentioned, such as alleviating economic stress and increasing women's power in the household. However, um, some more research is needed as we have some mixed results that it has shown that depending on the context, um, especially in terms of women's empowerment in that context and how women have outside options to be able to escape situations of violence, in case those are not available, uh, cash transfers might actually lead to backlash effects because there's some research that believes that men can be using violence to extract these resources from their partners. So that's just to say that whenever we're thinking about cash transfers programs, with, which have been very popular right now, uh, with so many social protections programs coming out of COVID-19 crisis, it is important to think how in different contexts they can affect women experiences of violence. Um, then also when looking at microcredit, savings programs and unemployment, as, among others, we can see from the evidence that they have limited impact and don't seem to be a very promising way to address IPV. But then finally, on the bright side, we also see that when these uh, interventions are bundled with other types of programs that are looking to address the underlying gender norms and gender inequalities that might be leading to um, acceptance of this form of violence, they sh do show better effects. So programs that connect microcredit to programs um, like fam family dialogues and trainings uh, seem to be an effective option. Then finally, as I said, gender trainings and media campaigns, so programs that are looking to address the underlying mechanisms and the underlying drivers of IPV are also seen as a very uh, promising approach. Um, so Vandana will talk a lot more about this. So I'll just say um, her program, for example, is a great example of um, a gender training. So a program that brings families and uh, couples and women and men together to discuss uh, ideas of gender, ideas of gender norms and acceptance of violence and helping participants change their views around it have shown to be very promising to reduce violence. The same for media campaigns, which are basically um, informational campaigns that can use videos or radio soap operas to dramatize and so show situations in which um, participants have dealt with violence against women in a different way, um, not accepting the gender norms that lead to them, for example, um, have show also potential effects on changing a viewer's perspectives around these and leading to less IPV and more reporting of these cases. So definitely more research is needed, but those are some key takeaways for us as we can go to a discussion of what works for COVID-19. Then to wrap up, I know I have a minute or less, um, just wanted to mention that uh, these all this research was done before COVID-19. So of course, it's not like we can just implement the same program and expect the same um, results with this new context that we are in. Uh, but we have research being conducted right now uh, that is trying to understand 
um, how this new context affect uh, the way we conduct data collection, the way we conduct implementation, especially doing everything remote. Um, so in Peru and Colombia, we just funded some projects looking at that. Um, and I'll also close by saying that, um, as you might be familiar with connect, uh, collecting data around gender-based violence and women's experience of violence is a big, big challenge, but given um, for uh, the, the challenges of sensitiv sensitivities around this topic. So if you're thinking about doing that right now, please refer to these awesome resources that we have available about how to increase uh, participant safety and data collect in data collection efforts. Um, and I'm also happy to chat more about that in our discussion. Thank you so much. Isabella, thank you so much. And you know, it's, I think it's a fantastic way to start the discussion, to point to the rich body of evidence we have that we can in fact address and prevent GBV. Um, and you've given us a fantastic overview of some of the interventions. I'm sure participants will have questions about replicability, scalability, and what some of the challenges are. Um, but I know we're going to hear a little bit more about um, some of these approaches from Vandana, so I don't want to preempt questions from the floor later. Um, Lauren, um, if I may, I'd like to turn to you. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. And thanks, Isabella. That was a terrific presentation. Um, in my presentation, uh, it's sort of my job um, to give some framing to our panel, showing how Isabel and Vandana's research work and NDI's programming and policy work on politics and political processes and Victoria's activism are so critical to building systems of resilience and government response to the pandemic of gender-based violence. Um, next slide. Um, I'm drawing a lot of the framing for this presentation on Laura Weldon's work that government, oh, actually, next slide, even more, um, that uh, government action um, to prevent and end violence takes the establishment of a feminist political power system that needs each of the, these hubs that I've outlined, and it really needs these mutually reinforcing relationships between them in order to secure government attention and policy and funding on the issues of preventing violence against women. So we know um, fundamentally that numbers of women's political representation in itself is insufficient for addressing gender-based violence. It really is when women and men in government with a feminist agenda come together in political associations, party caucuses, policy hearings, where they represent, negotiate, and seed funding and policy prescriptions to address violence against women. And they do it throughout the government in ministries of education, health, security sector. However, this feminist political association is also not enough. It has to be connected to and supported by an autonomous women's movement and civil society network and a feminist policy network. Um, we've seen how autonomous women's movements support political representatives by drawing attention to gender-based violence. Um, femicide, Me Too, forces the broader public to acknowledge and value the issue. And in so doing, it expands a range of ideas about what the problem is. And violence against women is no longer rests in the realm of privacy and family, but becomes a topic of public and political um, discourse. Civil society organizations also play their role in advancing um, government action. They do the everyday work to build capacity, train, they advocate to the goals of the movement, they hold governments accountable, and a strong women's policy network funnels and directs this raw power of women's social movements and the activism of civil society networks into a policy agenda based on their legitimacy as independent experts. And they also form that all important policy continuity when political transitions happen and women and men, feminist representatives um, move in and out of office. Next slide. Um, these systems that generate a government response to gender-based violence, and this is coming out of my research on resilience. So what happens when a shock occurs um, is that they often turn into resilient social systems and they do it um, in a number of important ways. 
Um, my research and network in research in Kenya and Amy Carpenter's in Iraq shows that there's some really important components to resilience systems. Um, number one, they have to have these network civil society organizations at the community and grassroots level. These are important because they have the working trust that can diagnose the violence problems from multiple dimensions and develop informed community strategies. It, to be resilient, these civil society and grassroots efforts have to be relinked in relationships to groups like women's policy networks that can inform the government of these strategies and community perspectives on the violence. And they galvanize and inform legitimate in the eyes of the population policy intervention by the state. So what we're seeing with COVID-19, um, next slide, is that the secondary impacts of COVID have battered the systems of resilience while increasing the risk. And Isabel has very nicely outlined a lot of the risk factors that we're seeing, um, how quarantine measures um, imposed by COVID-19 are putting women at heightened risk of violence in the home and they're limiting the ability or cutting them completely off from essential protection services. In Pakistan and Afghanistan, these protection services were not considered essential, so were shut down. We see the economic stresses on families um, that can put girls and women at greater risk of exploitation, sex trafficking, prostitution. And we see that global lockdowns also lock down women's autonomy um, and reinforce the idea that they're second class citizens. But we have to be really um, cognizant of the fact that the pandemic is also consolidating um, exclusionary power systems and undermining the very political systems that can be resilient to gender-based violence. I'd really like to point you to an exceptional study done by my colleague Caroline Hubbard in, uh, in cooperation with the Carnegie Endowment that describes how these resilience hubs and relationships are, are under threat. Women's representation in politics, in a way, faces a double threat. Women have a high financial bar barrier to buying into participation in political parties, which require 24-7 campaign cycles. All of this has been significantly imperiled by uh, uh, the inordinate burden of child and home care that women um, bear in this pandemic. There's been disruptions in formal political processes and a lot of political deal making has gone um, informal where male politicians um, dominate. In many cases, male political leaders have walked back formal commitments to women's political participation. And there's been a rapid shift to online, um, which has marginalized women politicians, but more importantly, exposing them to ever increasing risk of levels of violent, online violence as trolling and in, has increased with greater general internet use. In terms of the, the impacts on women's policy networks, we've seen the women policy networks that advance the feminine agenda have been cut out from um, government agendas. Their access to government agencies and pandemic task forces um, has been curtailed. I, I think the figure Caroline gives is that 82% of task forces are ma male. Um, women activists and civil society leaders are su experiencing government suppression and security from violent security forces and armed groups and, uh, and armed groups and isolation and marginalization. We are seeing some resiliencies emerge. Um, we've seen how some civil society organizations have become first responders in the pandemic and vocal overseers, critics and partners to governments. Their public stature and respect has often grown. I'm talking about the Federation of Women Muslim Activists in Nigeria, who are working on the front lines of the pandemic to inform women um, of the impact of the pandemic and inform them of protections. Rifiad in Eastern Congo, um, which is performing much the same work, and Africa's FemNet, which is trying to connect women who are isolated by the pandemic to share their stories and build a sense of solidarity. We're seeing another resilience in Mexico. Hungary and Poland feminist solidarity networks are emerging 
and they're building these all important relationships of resilience because they're working together across political and civil society and expert lines um, to diagnose the problems and, and to develop uh, creative solutions. And we're also seeing greater international recognition. Um, so next slide. So if we not so if we acknowledge that as the US government and international donors are beginning to do, that ending violence is a political process, um, then tackling this epidemic of gender-based violence is an issue of political will and political process strengthening. And it's about building on the pandemic's resiliencies and eradicating the very worst of the old approaches. We know in, in the old past political processes um, that there's a pervasive problem of staying feminism, a cozy event club that never resulted in reform and in fact suppressed voices of feminist movements, activists and NGOs. We saw layers of internationally funded NGOs that created barriers to grassroots activists and the donor darlings that were built up at the expense of other important resilience partners and relationships. Um, in terms of the old ways, perhaps the most damaging practice to building a system of government and resilient response to gender-based violence has been the systemic barriers perpetuated within the system itself, political, academic, socioeconomic, racial, and ethnic privilege have perverted the system in significant ways. Women of privilege have chosen their class, caste, and ethnic group over the greater enterprise of democracy and peace building. And in doing so, we laid not a foundation for resilience, but provided the inroads for authoritarian and populist leaders against the most marginalized women. So if we're gonna talk about how we address the pandemic of violence against women, um, and we need to talk about it in terms of a political processes and political will and building on resiliencies, then we have to think in terms of creating political will to end violence against women, um, for example, on instruments like the Global Fragility Act and the Millennium Challenge Corporation that rely on government compacts or political commitments and will that can generate this all important political leverage to end violence against women. Um, the Global Fragility Act um, is super in that it acknowledges that violence prevention and recovery is a political process and it seeks to transform political relationships even when implementing the Global Fragility Act. So the Global Fragility Act demands that it be implemented in ways that are inclusive, transparent, and favor engagement between civil society and government. But if violence prevention is at the heart of the GFA, then it must seek to end violence in all of its manifestations, including gender-based violence through government commitments. And if inclusion is the aim, then the Global Fragility Act must ensure the safety and security of marginalized groups and women to participate. It has got to prioritize programming to engender, address gender-based violence and systemic violence, or its primary goal, inclusive political processes won't be met as 50% of the population will not feel secure enough to engage in the GFA processes. In, and then in terms of thinking about how we strengthen the political processes and political power to end gender-based violence, we have to move beyond women's capacity building and empowerment. We, one of the, the most interesting and exciting parts of you know, the pandemic, if there is any silver lining in this, is that women's leadership um, is being legitimized and we're identifying a new generation of women political leaders. We cannot give them technical and capacity support without engaging and transforming the systems of cultural and political exclusion that they will have to work in. One of the best programs I think that NDI is doing, for example, in Sri Lanka, we are working with women journalists and politicians to change the narrative around women's leadership roles, trying to shape the media environment that is a significant source of violence against women. There's tremendous work being done by NDI, uh, the US Institute of Peace, Dean's organization Promundo on developing men as political allies and engaging men in discussions on masculinity um, and its relationship to violence and in particular violence against women.
In terms of women's policy networks, um, that's another possible resilience story under COVID. While they may be shut out of government discussions on the impacts of COVID, women are engaging virtually in networks of feminist solidarity, which are in some ways building and reinforcing these all important resilience connections. However, marginalized groups have been grossly excluded due to the lack of access to internet and social media. We've really got to seek the further elitization of these women policy networks, which may be one of the significant outcomes out of COVID. It's critical to connect this expert class with data and research uh, on the impacts of uh, pandemics on communities and marginalized groups. It's critical that marginalized women and groups shape the research agenda um, and participate in these research inquiries through participatory action research, action, action learning, and this whole process could increase the credibility of women's policy networks that are often seen as mouthpieces for Western progressive agendas to speak from the hard realities of the marginalized in their communities. And finally, I think we're seeing the whole entire civil society landscape change after COVID with some gender-based violence organizations taking on other tasks, some disintegrating from lack of funding, others rising to the fore. We must listen and we must learn and we must support these new um, and emerging um, civil society uh, groupings. And finally, I think a hard lesson learned from the pandemic is that exclusion eventually brings everyone down and ending gender-based violence where it is most felt within marginalized groups will require a hard look at the political processes and actors that are allied in the fight against gender-based violence. Doing a political economy analysis um, of who gets funding and who does not within the attempts to end gender-based violence and looking where the barriers to exclusion exist for marginalized groups and moving hard and quick, prioritizing their participation in programming, funding, and political commitments. Thank you. Wow, Lauren, thank you. That was an incredibly comprehensive overview of, I think, the, the kind of multi-sectoral um, and systems-focused approaches that we need I'm often in discussions about gender-based violence that focus very much on kind of community education, norms change, and I really appreciate the way you brought our attention to some of these bigger forces at play, international donor funds, um, you know, kind of elite groups operating at the national level, systems of exclusion and how we need to address that. Um, I think the field in general is hungry for this conversation about how we address some of the social and structural drivers of men's violence against women. Um, and I'm really glad this has been recorded because I want to go back and listen carefully to the many points you made. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, Vandana, I'm going to turn to you and I know you're going to provide us with, in some ways, a snapshot of um, a particular intervention in Ethiopia um, that addresses some of the social norms that drive violence. And so um, really looking forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to share some of the lessons and findings around Unite for a Better Life um, on behalf of my colleagues uh, and the partner organizations involved in this work in Ethiopia. So Unite for a Better Life is a community-based program that aims to prevent and reduce intimate partner violence and HIV transmission. Um, it was first developed for rural Ethiopian uh, communities um, between 2012 and 2018. And the key partners include uh, the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, or JPAL, which is where I was based for uh, the bulk of this work prior to moving over to Harvard, um, as well as Addis Ababa University in Gender Health and the Ethiopian Public Health Association. So I'm going to start with just a um, brief overview of the program. So just to give you a sense of sort of the different program components and um, sort of how it's structured. So as I mentioned, it's a gender transformative program that um, is delivered through group-based participatory sessions that focus on skills building. The sessions themselves are delivered by trained same-sex facilitators that are from the study areas or the, the intervention areas 
um, who um, are trained, and I'll talk a little bit more about the training uh, shortly, but the sessions are delivered within the context of a cultural or community practice in order to increase the cultural relevance and potential effectiveness of the program. So in Ethiopia, where um, we initially developed the program, the community platform or cultural practice that was uh, you know, served as the platform for delivery of the intervention is the traditional Ethiopian coffee ceremony. Now, the program comprises 14 sessions and covers a range of different topics, including, you know, gender roles, healthy sexuality, uh, HIV and condom use, boundaries and sexual consent, power and control in relationships, joint decision-making, task sharing, conflict resolution, and supporting survivors. And typically in the sessions, there are about 20 participants per group, and the ses sessions are delivered twice a week over seven weeks. Um, we have three different versions of the program. One version is delivered to groups of women, a different version is delivered to groups of men, and there's a third version which is designed to be delivered to groups of couples. Now, on this slide, you'll just see our theory of change. I won't go into this in a lot of detail, but I'll just mention that the program was designed to address the complex uh, factors that underlie IPV risk. Um, and that includes an interaction of factors at the individual level, the relationship level, the community level, and as well some of the societal factors that uh, underlie um, IPV and HIV risk in this context. The goal really, as I said, is to um, address IPV and HIV transmission through improvements in knowledge, attitudes, and skills. Um, for example, improving couples' healthy communications, um, reducing HIV risk behaviors, and substance use. And then in terms of the coffee ceremony component, um, I just wanted to mention that in rural Ethiopia, men and women typically participate in the coffee ceremony. However, it's women who usually take on the role of preparing and pouring the coffee. So implementing the curriculum within the context of the coffee ceremony actually also provided an opportunity to model and promote more equitable norms. As an example, in the men's um, UBL groups, male facilitators would model the preparation of coffee for the first two sessions and then following this the male participants in the groups would each take turns for the remainder of the sessions to lead the coffee ceremony and so that's something that's traditionally as i said a woman's role um, and so taking on that um uh, taking on that task within the sessions actually um, was built into and integrated in some of the dialogue and dis discussion as well. Similarly, in the couples groups, the two facilitators um, who led those sessions would model the preparation of the coffee in the first two sessions, and that was followed by different couples taking turns preparing the coffee in the remaining sessions. So UBL um, now encompasses several different research and programming streams that have all aimed to generate evidence about what works in different contexts. As I mentioned, the first, um, uh, the first version of the program was developed for rural Ethiopia. Um, and we did test the program using a randomized control trial in this context. Um, we, I, I will speak a bit more of those results in a few minutes, but the uh, trial included almost 7,000 households across four districts. In addition, we received some funding from ELRA's Humanitarian Innovation Fund to adapt the program for a humanitarian context, in particular Somali refugee camps in Dalo Addo, Ethiopia. And there the process of adaptation involved conducting formative research to really better understand the drivers of IPV and HIV risk in that context, including how displacement has changed risks, and then using that um, data to inform and adapt the content for this particular setting. Now, in this context, um, the traditional coffee ceremony is not a community practice. However, a Somali tea talks are a way that the community gathers. And so that was employed as sort of a platform for delivering the sessions. And then finally, there's a, a third sort of adaptation of UBL, which is a podcast-based adaptation. Now, that 
um, adaptation was developed and piloted in order to expand the program for harder to reach populations in both low income and humanitarian settings when in-person group-based sessions may not be possible. And so this approach is actually particularly relevant now as well in the context of COVID um, when there are restrictions, for example, on group-based um, gatherings. Now with the UBL podcast based version of the intervention, the same content is delivered as in the in-person sessions, but instead of meeting in person, the um, sessions are in the form of audio episodes that consist of dramas, interviews, and debates. And these episodes can be broadcast at listening centers or safe spaces within the community or they could potentially be downloaded onto people's devices and listened to in their own homes. So now I will just um, really briefly tell you a little bit more about the findings of our randomized control trial to give you an understanding of sort of um, how the intervention works and whether it works um, and what we've seen. So the um, uh, intervention, the impact and the relative effectiveness of delivering the program to either groups of women, groups of men, or groups of couples, and comparing that to a control group that received a very short uh, informational session on violence reduction. We had 16 villages per arm for a total of 64 villages, and approximately 106 households per village were randomly selected for participation. Um, we collected our follow-up data two years post-intervention and looked at a range of indicators related to IPV, HIV, and other um, sort of uh, relationship factors, including task sharing, decision-making, and so on. So our main findings are presented here and they're available for you to look at in more detail um, in Plus Medicine and as well on the JPAL website, there was a blog post that just went live a few days ago as well that delves deeper into this. But I think the key uh, findings I wanted to touch on are the fact that uh, men's UBL significantly reduced IPV, both um, male perpetration and also women's experience of IPV. We also saw sig significant changes on a range of I HIV outcomes and also in male involvement in child care um, and household chores and in joint decision making. The other thing I wanted to just mention is that the impacts of UBL went beyond just the, the individual participants. Uh, we saw broader impacts in the communities. Uh, we had spillover households that were not involved in the program that were other neighboring households and we saw effects in those houses as well. We also saw impacts amongst the facilitators who were delivering the sessions. Um, and so, so that I think is really important when we're thinking about things like cost effectiveness and scale. Now, I just wanted to quickly touch on a couple of the key lessons that emerged from this work. And I think one of the major ones is about the importance of community engagement and participation across all levels of IPV programming. That's imperative um, in, in order to achieve change. And in our program, we certainly um, did that in multiple ways. We set up a community advisory board to provide ongoing feedback um, throughout the course of the project. We ha also had regular consultations with women. And I know that in the context of COVID, um, this may be particularly challenging right now. Um, and we've heard from our partners on the ground that community engagement is is particularly challenging and they've had to sort of shift um, their thinking uh, from the standard ways of participating, uh, in, engaging the community. Some of the other lessons I've sort of touched on throughout the presentation already, but you know, formative research to really have a strong understanding of the determinants of IPV in that particular setting and using that to inform your program, uh, whether it's a new program or an adapted version of the program. The other key sort of uh, lesson was around um, the facilitation and sort of making sure that the facilitators 
are um, from the study areas or the intervention areas that they are really well equipped to take on the role of um, acting as agents of change within the communities. And we achieved that through a couple of ways. One was ensuring that the facilitators actually participated in the program first in order to have the opportunity to um, confront their own inequitable attitudes and norms, and then following that, participating in additional facilitation training. And then there were a couple of lessons around program delivery that you'll see here on the slide. Um, a lot of these relate again to sort of making sure we have community feedback on the way the program's being delivered, um, you know, timing of sessions, frequency, location. And then a really, really important one is around uh, risk mitigation and making sure your programming is not um, having unintended consequences or causing harm. And so we employed strategies around that at all levels of the program. And then to wrap up, I just wanted to touch really quickly on COVID and sort of how we might think about IPV prevention during a pandemic. And so I think the previous panelists talked a lot about sort of um, some of the changes we're seeing and kind of exacerbation of underlying inequities um, that have been brought on by the COVID pandemic. And I think that um, as Isabella was saying too, we have a strong evidence base already about um, what works in terms of IPV prevention programming um, and some new ongoing research currently in the context of um, COVID. But I just wanted to mention that you know, current response efforts can draw on insights from the available evidence, including rigorous impact evaluations, even if it was done pre-pandemic, and that there are a lot of lessons there that can be used to inform creative adaptations um, that could be applicable and implemented within the context of COVID. Um, and I think there are lots of shifts towards sort of remote modalities, a lot of colleagues I know who are working on IPV prevention programming have talked about um, moving in-person sessions to say WhatsApp sessions or phone-based sessions. And so I think there's um, a lot of uh, piloting and experimentation going on right now. We can certainly learn from going forward. I do wanna point out that shifting modalities may bring on additional so I think it's really important to consider that when we're thinking about these sorts of adaptations. And so I will end there and um, thank you so much and I'll pass it back to you, Dean. Great, Vandana, thank you so much. A really excellent overview of, I think the complexities of implementing rigorous evidence-based interventions in local communities. I've been involved in quite a few randomized control trials like the one you described and know well just how hard it is to, to produce the kinds of results you did. So um, amazing, super impressive results. Congratulations. Um, and I'm sure people will have questions um, for you in just a moment. Uh, Vicky, we're a little bit over time. We're actually quite a bit over time. Um, I know you already planned to go over by a few minutes. So if I could ask you just to keep it to those 12 minutes as best as you possibly can. Um, the floor is yours, Vicky. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jean. I will make it fast. Um, I will talk about uh, Lebanon and the um, challenges that women are facing. But in Lebanon, it's not, it's not just about uh, COVID-19. It's also about the economic crisis and the Beirut explosion. So just to put you in the, uh, in the reality that we are living right now, for the economic crisis recently in the past, uh, in the last year, uh, the Lebanese lira lost 80% of its value, which means that uh, Lebanese people are currently uh, just seeing the, uh, the value of their savings and their salaries just wiped out. Uh, and uh, facing COVID-19 as well, we are now at a critical phase uh, when in October last month, uh, in the report of the WHO, they were saying that intensive care units have already reached a critical 82% of capacity, and I'm sure that now it's even more. And the Beirut explosion that happened four months ago when a large amount of ammonium nitrate stored at Beirut port exploded. Uh, this is one of the biggest uh, explosion in the history. Um, 
it caused a lot of damage, uh, causing more than 200 deaths, 6,500 injuries. Uh, more than 1,000 are left with uh, lifetime uh, disabilities and over 300,000 homeless. So facing these three shocks, I will speak now about uh, how women and girls are uh, facing this and especially on the gender-based uh, violence. Uh, from the economic crisis uh, affecting women and girls, I will just give two examples. The first one is about the child marriage. It's, it's a topic that is really important for me. Uh, like these children are just getting married because their parents cannot afford education or even uh, health care or... Uh, or the minimum basic food for the for their daily life. So 13% increase in child marriage. It's because um, uh, you know, re uh, recently the, the recent studies are showing more than 55% of the population living below the poverty line. And this is by May 2020. So now also these numbers are even uh, worse. The second uh, example that I will give you on the economic crisis and how it is affecting women and how the gender lens is practically absent from any policy in the country. So uh, it's also related then to the economic crisis. And when the government decided to, to choose around 300 uh, basic items that they felt that it should be subsidized good, um, Unfortunately, they didn't uh, see that uh, sanitary products should be part of this. Razors were, uh, were one of the items they chose, but not the sanitary pads. While uh, these products, uh, the prices increased for more than 500%. And in, in a recent study, it showed that 66% of girls and women were saying that they cannot afford to buy their monthly needs. So a lot of NGOs and one of them is female is working on ending uh, uh, period poverty for girls and women by distributing at least uh, their needs. Uh, to talk also about uh, the COVID and how it is affecting women. Basically, when we start talking about COVID in Lebanon, women are emotionally and physically exhausted because most of the uh, nurses and the, the, the medical staff are women. Women are still in Lebanon having this uh, stereotype or assuming at least, let's say, the role, the informal healthcare providers and caretakers. Plus, with the pandemic, they have to take care of their children, online studies, of the household, of the workload that they have, plus their work. So starting with that, they are already exhausted. Adding to that, oh, that the stress, as uh, the panelists mentioned already, is adding the violence and the, the clashes, uh, let's say. So I'm showing you here some numbers. Over 180% increase of the calls received to, to the hotlines, for instance. And uh, we know that these numbers are just indicators because, as we said before, some people, some women will not even call to, to talk about that. It's, it's very hard for them. And some of them, they don't have access to TV or to, uh, to uh, Internet to know about the numbers or to even know that uh, these services were available during the confinement. So several campaigns were done. We, uh, you can see like in this uh, post, several numbers in one post just to show solidarity and to show that everyone is working on this issue. It's important. It's okay to talk about it. It's not a taboo anymore. Plus, in addition to this, about, for instance, one of the CSOs in Lebanon did this campaign where everyone with the collaboration of municipalities and the neighborhood, we were putting the numbers, the hotline just for these women to know in case they don't have access to television or to, uh, to internet, just to know about the numbers and to know that uh, the service is available. 
In addition to that, the CSOs in Lebanon are working to put pressure on the Ministry of Justice to make sure that during the, the confinement, at least the courts were available online. And in fact, in April, we were able to have the first uh, uh, protection order uh, in response to domestic violence. It was online and the, the, the woman and her children were protected. Screens Do Not Protect campaign is a campaign done by a CSO called Female because they saw that during the, uh, the pandemic, a lot of people are using all kinds of online platforms. Thus, there was a lot of um, uh, cyber crimes it amplified like with 184 percent so it was about telling people that no the screen will not protect you especially for the girls and women to make sure that there is an awareness campaign about that it's it's not just about the local uh, ngos it was a joint effort to make sure that no one will be hungry because uh, with with the crisis, yani we are talking about the economic crisis, the COVID, the pandemic, and the explosion. Food insecurity was also one of the biggest issues facing women and girls specifically. And this is why local NGOs, international organizations, municipalities, and private businesses were working together. So you can see in the examples that I will show you right now. For the private businesses, for instance, you can see in this photo here, one of the restaurants that was in Beirut explosion, they were also preparing hot meals every day and sending to the families. You can also see these paintings. So uh, a lot of artists did this exhibition wh when, uh, wh uh, where the explosion happened and the, pa the paintings were also to, um, to support families in need. And you can see that volunteers are uh, all the time, um, uh, all the feminist uh, grassroots NGOs were among the first respondents were when the explosion happened. And it's because of this explosion, a lot of um, women and girls were, uh, were also not feeling safe because some people can't even close their homes. Some people, um, there is no street lighting. So for that, all CSOs and all the organizations even had their tents in the streets to make sure that they are supporting these families, they are uh, giving at least a minimum of safety uh, to the volunteers and to the people living there. In addition to that, in one of the studies uh, conducted by Abad, they were saying that even in some KIs that uh, the, the presence of military and police did not uh, did not reflect any safety for these people, quite the opposite. So the presence of the volunteers and of the women all the time in these streets was uh, very important. And showing this solidarity was one of the uh, key success in order to prevent more gender-based violence. And you can see in this photo, for instance, Oberge Beiti, one of the CSOs, having these stands and these tables all the time uh, next to them to the damaged houses. Uh, food insecurity as well uh, was one of the issues impacting all uh, migrant workers. And in Lebanon, the majority of uh, migrant workers are women as well. So just to conclude very quickly, uh, in, in Lebanon, there is a lack of policies. There is no government right now. So uh, feminists and the uh, women group were working together with the UN women. And we did one feminist charter of demands just to make sure that if there is any policy or any strategy to make sure that we are including all the women needs and one of them is definitely the gender-based violence. Working with uh, uh, all the time, especially, and I, I wanted to add the explosion because we really showed during this explosion that these groups were among the first respondents working on multiple level. And uh, I want to add with these three photos, 
because uh, Lebanese women are now like are really on the front lines and we are fighting for change we are fighting for a better future and I know that we will get it and these three photos the one in the middle is uh, one of uh, the photo from the Lebanese uprising that happened recently since October 17 last year so this is a woman kicking um, an armed guard who was trying to uh, to separate the uh, women and girls in the protest and the one that you see on the right it's a statue from the shattered glasses uh, after the explosion and from destroyed items from different houses showing Beirut as, as a standing woman and uh, someone who's going to fight and the last photo it's one of my favorite stories after the Beirut explosion that was really devastating for us. This is a nurse, instead of running for her life after the explosion, she was running to save these three newborns and uh, that was a success. She was able to save their lives. So I wanted to end with this uh, positive note and uh, thank you for listening. Vicky, thank you so much, and thank you for sticking to time. Um, you know, and the story you tell is incredibly inspiring. Um, under enormously difficult circumstances, women and men coming together um, to demand change. And of course, um, the leadership of groups like Abad and others has been um, spectacular to watch from a distance. So congratulations and thanks for a, as I say, a truly inspiring presentation. Um, you know, it's interesting, we've talked a lot about COVID and the impact um, that COVID has had on women and on survivors of, of gender-based violence. The other phenomenon that we um, witnessed here in the US and that I think reverberated around the world, certainly it did in South Africa, was the Black Lives Movement. Um, and I think it raised complicated questions for those of us who are involved in advocacy to address gender-based violence, particularly around our strong reliance on the criminal legal system um, and some of the unintended consequences that that's had. In South Africa, we continue to have extraordinarily high levels of violence against women, some of the highest in the world. Um, and the response often from politicians and sometimes from women's rights advocates is to demand ever harsher criminal legal sanctions, lengthened sentences, um, abolition of bail, reinstatement of the death penalty, chemical castration, even though we know that those kinds of harsh criminal legal sanctions actually do um, very little um, to address and prevent GBV. And so it's been really exciting to hear um, your collective articulation of the alternatives. Um, Lauren, your big picture presentation on the need for multi-sectoral responses, on the need for a strong civil society um, sector that can really push government um, and provide some of the technical expertise around policies, around what works on the ground. Um, Isabella and Vandana, to hear your presentations that have given us a good sense of what does work at the community level. And I think you grappled a little bit with some of these questions around replicability and scalability. Vandana, in your presentation, um, pointing to the role of radio as a way to expand the reach and the impact. I'm thinking about how you do this work safely in these times of COVID. Um, and Vicky, your big picture presentation to kind of um, bring us back full circle of how women have been buffeted by these various crises in Lebanon um, and the ways in which um, you are collectively demanding change. So I'm sure the participants, um, all 50 of them still with us, have lots of questions. Um, I have seen a few. And unfortunately, I'm going to acknowledge it's very hard to read the questions in this um, little text box we've got here. Um, but I can see, Vandana, that a number of them are um, directed at you. I think, um, Isabella, you've had some around um, kind of reports. Um, so I'm just going to turn to those that I immediately see. Um, Vandana, one of the questions was, in your experience, did religious beliefs play any role in women wanting to remain with abusive intimate partners. Um, and then a second question also directed to you was um, from someone who works as a therapist who says, I'm curious as to how the facilitators and the project structure 
was able to support women who chose to and who needed to leave or end their relationships with their intimate partner and also repair opportunities. So um, while I crane into the computer to try and read some of the others, um, Vandana, do you want to kick us off with responses to those two questions? Sure. Thanks so much for those questions. Um, I think they're really good questions. And, um, you know, there's a lot to discuss there. And I think um, I can start with the one around the religious beliefs. Um, so in our sort of rural Ethiopian context, uh, we had um, probably around 60% of the households identified or reported as being Muslim and the remaining uh, 40% or so uh, Christian. And then the second context that we worked in the refugee camps in Dalo Addo, um, the populations we were working with there were entirely Muslim. And we did see sort of differences um, in terms of how much sort of religion was discussed or came about, came up, I think, in our sort of formative research as um, as a factor that may somehow influence um, norms and attitudes around IPV. Um, I think it was more pronounced in the refugee context that we work in, um, justification, uh, using religion as a justification for violence was um, I think quite widely, uh, quite a widely held um, norm. And so, you know, there were a lot of discussions with our, during our consultation period and our formative research and with stakeholders on the ground and with religious leaders about how best to address um, some of those. Um, a lot of it seemed to be driven through sort of certain types of interpretations of what is in the religious texts and, may, and, and not necessarily, you know, accurate views about what's, what's stated in those texts. And so we actually brought on, um, uh, we, we brought in some feedback from religious leaders in the camp and, you know, clan leaders and so on to help sort of help the program better frame the dialogue around that. So it was it was addressed more so, I think, in that humanitarian adapted version. And there were sessions where uh, participants would uh, you know, discuss that and discuss specific passages from the Quran, for example, and kind of explore that together with the facilitators. Um, as to the other question around sort of supporting survivors of violence, I think that was something that is something very important to consider in a program like this. Even um, for a project that's solely research-based, I think we need to have in place mechanisms to support survivors, uh, whether or not they choose to disclose to the uh, research team or the pr program team. And so one of the things that we did in the rural Ethiopian context is provide a list of resources available in the area to all participants of the data collection or of the program. Um, we noted that in our initial sort of mapping of resources that there, there were very few resources available and um, for example, no counseling or other types of services in the area. So we as a project decided to actually hire our own counselors and post them within the primary health facilities in the area so that there was um, a trained person that women could seek support from. So that's how we addressed it in the project. And then in the refugee camp, there are well-established referral mechanisms already in place for survivors of GBV, which we linked in uh, into and um, were able to refer uh, women to those particular clinics or um, organizations. Great, thank you, Vandana. Um, I see another few questions, which uh, one of them is a general question to the panelists. Um, so whoever would like to uh, speak to this one, please do go ahead. Um, a participant who's saying, um, she's, uh, believe us, she's starting a blog and podcast on peace building for women and girls, both in the US and around the world. Um, in your opinions, what are the most important topics to focus on that will be helpful to the listeners and readers? So. Uh, that's a big question. Who'd like to um, take a go at it? 
I can start, although I don't have a final answer to that. One, congrats. That sounds like a great um, initiative to take on right now, especially as people are more connected to the internet and might be more having more free time or more willingness to um, engage with those platforms. I think that looking at what we discussed about evidence-based um, interventions that show positive impacts, definitely maybe focusing on gender norms and um, pieces or reviews or videos that could be addressing those underlying norms that lead to the acceptance of violence. So we know that even if the girls um, or the women reading them might already have these different perspectives, maybe providing tools and mechanisms through which they could be um, bringing uh, this critical thinking to their households, to their partners, to their parents. And just starting this conversation, I believe would be a great way to start having some change um, in how people see this issue and then um, help um, prevent this type of violence from happening. Also curious to hear what the other panelists think. I Dean, I'd, I'd like to add to that um, and just say terrific. As a mother of three girls, I think it's fantastic um, that you're starting this podcast. And I I think some of the things that, that really need to be emphasized um, in the podcast, and it gets back to Isabel's issue around data and evidence, which is that we know for a fact that women's inclusion in political processes and peace processes um, make them sustainable, um, help uh, implement them well. Um, and so just to emphasize over and over again, the importance of women's agencies um, in these very, very important political processes and dialogues. But the second thing I'll, I, I do wanna say, and it's since I've joined NDI from um, the peace building world um, and myself am becoming familiar with politics and po political processes and political strengthening is that I don't think we do enough in the peace building world um, to think about power and how power is changed and transformed. I think in the peace building process, um, we look more at uh, community relationships, bringing the people together, and we don't often think about sort of raw political power and how we in need to engage with these political processes um, in order to achieve the peace building success that we want to achieve. Um, and that's one of the sort of the profound things that I've learned from NDI is that politics is hard. Um, it's not necessarily a, a peaceful process. Um, it, it, it's confrontational, it's conflictual. Um, and so I hope very much that your peace building podcast emphasizes to women and girls the importance of their political participation as well as their peace building participation. Great, thank you, Lauren. And I'm, I'm really glad you raised the question of power. I've been looking quite closely at raising voices model um, in Uganda, and they've of course shown um, the powerful effect that community mobilization can have um, on changing gender norms and improving outcomes for women and girls. Um, and they break power out into a range of different categories. Um, power over, I think we're very familiar with in the field of gender-based violence prevention. And um, I think we pay a little bit less attention to the kind of power um, that is really um, integral to autonomous women's movements and to social movements more generally, which is power with, power to achieve change. Um, and as a South African, of course, I've seen upfront, um, you know, and, and very powerfully the impact of that kind of um, collective action for social change. And so just wanna bring in um, this dynamic of power with and encourage people to have a look at raising voices um, really fantastic materials. Um, so anyone else like to speak to this question um, raised about a uh, about kind of key priorities to include in a blog? Uh, no, then I'm going to see if I can change the screen setting, Lauren. Um, let's see if I can do that correctly. There we go. Great. Um, all this new technology. Um, the other question, um, which is really more of a comment, um, was back to the question of laws. And I, I don't know, Vicky or Lauren, if you've perhaps got thoughts on this. This was a comment um, from someone, I think, based here in the US, 
who says in some ways just implementing the laws already on the books could reduce gender-based violence. Castle Rock versus Gonzalez, Supreme Court ruling that stated that the police cannot be sued, cannot be held properly accountable for not enforcing a restraining order. Um, this is a huge gap in policy. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, whether it's in Lebanon or whether it's through your um, analytical work, Lauren, um, how you think we can in fact um, get closer to proper implementation of the laws and of the policies that are already on the books. Yeah. So on uh, this point, like I can say that in Lebanon, for instance, uh, women or people in general do not know about the specifics about the laws. So this is one of the things that is being used to just make sure that sometimes uh, law already existing are not are not being applied. Plus one other example in Lebanon specifically, we don't have just one personal law status. We have different ones based on different sects, which means that even when we are having awareness campaigns about this, you just need to make sure that you are talking about this sect specifically. Uh, let's take, for instance, uh, children custody. It's different from a religion to another and from a sect to another. So this is one of the biggest fight that we have right now to try to have one one unified uh, uh, personal uh, status law. On another thing as well, we have laws that are still waiting to be um, approved, for instance, for the child marriage. It has been three years that we are talking about this. And sometimes when they select one law, they change some clauses in this law, and then it's uh, it's again changing the whole thing. So it's, it's too different. I, I would say two different uh, problems that we have with the laws. Some of them are already exist, existing and as it was said in the comment, they are not impl implemented well because there is a lack of, law, of knowledge about them and some other laws are just waiting to be implemented but then we need a political will to be able to do that. And this is why we need more women in the parliament in order to uh, to raise the voice and to talk about this issue. And this is shown right now because we had a lot of women saying that now they are not ta talking, for instance, about gender-based violence or are not calling about that because they feel that there are different priorities, more important that they need to take uh, care of. While if we have... Uh, women in politics uh, raising voices and talking about this and putting it as a high priority they would be they would feel more uh, confident to talk about that and uh, fight for that uh, and of course if there are the laws then they would feel more secure and more safe mm -hmm. Great, i'd like you. to add to vicky's um comments also from my experience working in ukraine which has tried to implement significant gender-based violence uh, laws against gender-based violence and I, I think one of the issues too just adding to vicky's comments is that you know judicial systems are often not prepared for these laws um and so a lot of training needs to go into judges um in terms of how to try these cases um there's often not not sentencing um, uh, prerequisites applied to them. So the judicial system is not prepared in some ways to actually implement these laws. Um, so in Ukraine, there were actually conferences of justices um, to think through how they would be tried, what are the protocols for trying them, um, and what are the sentencing guidelines in these places in a country where there had been no precedence for this. I think the other important uh, uh, case, which doesn't have to be, I think, stated um, because we've stated it all in our presentations, um, which is that those people on the front lines of enforcing those laws, the police forces, um, have to have training um, in order for uh, women's victims to even want to appeal to um, or engage the system. And the final issue that really is important, and it really, I think, <laughs> nicely ties our panel together, um, with Vandana and Isabella's work is really the need for data. 
Um, you know, judicial systems have to be held accountable um, for uh, for uh, addressing gender-based violence, but without the data to show where they are falling down um, and uh, in terms of addressing the issue, um, judicial systems will tur turn the other eye. Um, Dean, if I can um, just jump in, I would love to add a little bit to what Lauren and Vicky just said, which I totally agree with. Um, and as you're mentioning, Lauren, about bringing evidence to um, these issues, I can mention that I know there is a lot of ongoing research, especially not at the judicial uh, system or judges level, but with the police on looking how to better respond to women, because as I mentioned, uh, lower rates of reporting are an issue when we are trying to deal with gender-based violence. So there is some evidence showing that the fact the female police officers definitely are a start in um, encouraging women or survivors to come forward and feel more comfortable um, in reporting those cases because usually police stations can be very um, gendered, masculine environments that they don't feel safe going or reporting. But but only uh, increasing women's representation, some evidence has been showing that it's not enough. So I totally just wanted to um, support Lauren's uh, argument that training is necessary. So uh, uh, for example, uh, JPOW has funded two um, evaluations now in India that have increased um, women's uh, uh, representation in police stations through women's help desks, through uh, dedicated teams uh, working focused on gender-based violence, but definitely always accompanying these by trainings and skills building, skill building, because that's very important in order for the officers to be able to respond to that. Great, thank you, Isabella, and thank you um, to all the panelists for those very thoughtful responses. Just two um, thoughts of my own, if I may, here. One, um, Vicky, you know, in South Africa, one of the approaches that's been used a lot, both in the field of HIV um, prevention and in gender-based violence prevention, has been rights literacy, making sure that community members really understand the laws and the policies and how they can take action to enforce them at the local level, um, how they hold uh, criminal uh, justice system officials to account and in fact, how they make the oversight mechanisms um, that the government has set up function effectively. There was an important constitutional court ruling um, just earlier in the week, in fact, around one of the oversight bodies um, demanding that it be truly independent of the line ministry that it's supposed to monitor and hold accountable. So I think there's a rich conversation to be had about how citizens can engage in um, community-based accountability, how we can, um, you know, do the necessary rights literacy work to make sure that ordinary citizens understand their rights and can um, demand them. And then the second thought goes in some ways in a very different direction. I'm, I've been following the debates here in the US around um, the over-reliance on the criminal legal system. And as I said, in South Africa, um, very strong orientation towards arrest, incarceration, um, and, and, you know, in the words of a number of politicians locking people up forever. Um, and I think um, there's an interesting question as to whether that's what survivors in fact want. Are we asking survivors whether in fact the solution that they're looking for is primarily a criminal legal one? Groups here in the US like the SE Justice Group based out of Oakland have done a lot of work to try and understand what survivors of violence want. Um, similarly, the um, Alliance for Safety and Justice, their crime survivors report, um, you know, I think tells us that it's not as simple as that, that many survivors are not looking to the criminal legal system, partly because it fails them so repeatedly, and partly because they're looking for more restorative, more transformative approaches. And so I do think here in the US, there's a very interesting conversation happening about how we expand the repertoire of responses um, and focus on a lot of the interventions and approaches that you've all articulated, um, you know, autonomous women's movements that can demand change beyond just arrest, conviction, sanction, um, and towards Vandana and Isabella, some of the initiatives that you've described as working to prevent the violence upstream. Um, so 
I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, this tension between um, access to criminal legal sanctions um, and some of the unintended consequences of that, whether it's in fact what survivors want and what some of the alternatives might be that address the problem before it happens. Um, I realize that's a big and complicated question, but if anyone wants to have a go at it. I just want to say one thing about this. Um, I, I, in my opinion, the role of media is very important in all, if, in all this discussion, and uh, I don't think that we tackle that as, uh, uh, like, with examples, because media is, especially now during the pandemic, is uh, is reflecting a lot of issues, is highlighting the most important issues, and unfortunately, I can say, like in Lebanon. It's not taking the gender issues in consideration or the way that it should be. Maybe if we can talk about this a little bit more, if we can break the stereotypes a little bit more, we can then Jean, do as you were saying and prevent violence and have something like on the longer run and breaking this taboo about talking of this. I think also Vandana talked about how sometimes we use the religion or other uh, maybe traditions to justify violence and we need the media to help us to break this uh, this image you know and in the same time we cannot neglect that we need to see that there is punishment because a lot of time we see that someone who already like committed any violent act towards someone after a few months he will do the same or she will do the same towards someone else so Preventing this is also about punishing the act whenever it happens as well. Thank you. Um, any other quick comments in response to um, my intervention? Otherwise, I can go back to um, the questions that are coming in in the chat. Uh, let me do that then. Lauren, there's a question for you. Um, the question is, uh, you mentioned that the pandemic has given opportunities for women political leaders to take on leadership roles in building resilience. Are there any lessons to be learned in how we can make sure these are sustained during COVID recovery? Um, I think some of the lessons learned um, for women political leaders that are coming out of the pandemic um, is that uh, government failure um, has provided tremendous opportunity for women leaders um, to succeed in these environments. I think where I grow concerned um, is that, you know, this will provide tremendous opportunities globally um, for women to step into um, political leadership. Um, uh, civil society often provides the roots for women's political leadership. Um, but I, I dearly am concerned um, that we will have not learned the lessons um, in terms of preparing women to be political leaders uh, uh, after the pandemic in the sense that there's always been a lot of emphasis traditionally, I think and organizations like NDI and IRI are changing that, that it has been a lot of capacity building, how you run a campaign, et cetera. And really we need to do just as much on the other side um, around breaking the political power networks of exclusion in order to allow political women's political power to succeed. Um, so that is around um, political party work, um, that is around um, media work, um, that is around legislative work. Um, so creating that all important political uh, enabling environment um, that is necessary for women's leadership to excel. Great, thank you, Lauren. Um, I see we are fast approaching the end of the session. Um, and I don't know if each of you wants to take 30 seconds to make any final points or if that's unfair pressure to put it on you at this point. But anyone have a quick closing comment to make? If not, um, 
I'd really like to thank you for your participation. I think it's been a really, really unusually rich discussion. And to those of you participating um, who we haven't been able to see, I want to thank you for your comments, um, your questions, and um, really to thank NDI for putting this panel together and for all of the organizations that have come together today to make this happen. Um, and I think with that, um, I'll close the session. Um, so thanks very much to each of you. Really appreciate your time and the incredible work you are all doing day in, day out. Thank you, Dean. You've been a terrific moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining and for this great discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.